Okay, uh, let's start and let's just go down the line and everybody introduce yourself. Jeremy, Wait, did, are those mics working? Okay. Go ahead, try again. I'm Jeremy, Basecamp, okay. Bit Sweat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Aaron, I'm not a pony. <laughs> uh, I'm Godfrey. I'm Santiago, I'm the co-founder and, and CEO of Whiteworks. I'm Guillermo, I'm from Colombia, and I work in a company named Ripe. Hi, I'm uh, Andrew, I'm Unbox CTO, and um, I'm Pixel Tricks on GitHub. Okay, um, I think, you know, we don't have a ton of time, so I thought what I would do is that we talk a lot about, we could talk a little bit about kind of like upcoming changes and stuff, but I thought sort of going along with what we talked about during Ruby Heroes, we would talk a little bit about how you ended up in, on Rails Core. I think that's really interesting to a lot of people. So uh, why don't we go, we'll go back this, this direction. Okay. Um, how long have you been on Rails Core and how, like, how did that come about? Did you just, you know, just take a minute or so and... Okay. and um, I've been Rails Core since late 2012. Uh, and that basically came about through just contributing to Rails. So I've been contributing to Rails since 2007, uh, where I contributed to Rails was I had a problem with my app, bug in Rails, fixed it in my app. Next version of Rails came out, broke my app. I thought, <laughs> might as well fix this, fix this in Rails. So I submitted a patch and just gradually worked from there. That's basically it. Okay, yeah, like uh, Andrew, I started contributing to Rail, looking for the problems and the bugs that I found in my app. Yeah, I seen that every new version of, of Rails started to break my app, so I need to fix this. I, and I'm part of the Rails course in, since uh, like uh, three years. Okay, I'm, I'm part of the Rails uh, core since 2010, I think, and uh, I started to get involved with, with Rails development, basically based on, on issues I had in my applications. Also, once I joined to, um, to a, a, hack, a hack fest or something like that that happened during a weekend, like triaging the issue tracker and working on that, and that way I get involved with all the stuff. Um, so you probably noticed a trend by now, like everyone else, I started contributing to Rails by finding bugs in my own application. I was like, oh, why doesn't this work? And I was like, well, maybe I can just fix it. So I wrote patch to fix it, and then like some years ago, I came to the Rails core of this hour, made Aaron merge my patch, and I started doing more, and that's basically the TLDR. So if you haven't done that already, we're still here, and you can still do that. My yeah. turn. <laughs> We're going to say the answer for all of them, and that's okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so there were no bugs in my application. I just, <laughs> I just I just wandered in off the street. I, I don't know. How, why am I here? <laughs> how did I get here? <laughs> how long have you been on Rails? I have no idea. I don't know. How long have I been on the Rails? I guess. Four five years? years? Five. Maybe five years. Okay. Maybe. Four years or five years. Okay. Seems legit. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy? Um, I, I'll echo the pattern. That's how I got involved in Rails, too. When, uh, when Rails was first coming out and trying to port applications I'd written in, in Ruby and PHP and Java um, to do new development in Rails and finding missing pieces. Um, and that's what I've seen with everybody coming into Rails, the consistency of noticing issues, addressing them, following up on them. It, it, it's kind of interesting because it seems like an, an easy thing, but it's also a surprisingly rare thing, the long tail of contributors. If you go to contributors.rubyonrails.org, there are thousands of people who have done one thing, which is awesome. But doing two things or three things already gets you into kind of a rarefied territory, so I encourage it. <laughs> so that's a good transition to my next question uh, for for, we'll start with Jeremy. You probably have the most to say about this. We'll pull pull the curtain back a little bit for a moment, and uh, do you could maybe say what the process was for introducing new people into into Rails Core? Is it just like a discussion amongst all of Rails Core, and is it a formal thing, or is it just a very informal process? It's very informal. It's gotten more formal, but uh, sometimes I feel like people really introduce themselves. It's like the way that you fix issues and. It's like people are there on the door, they're already 
in the core team essentially just by virtue of their contributions. It's like the way Aaron came into the core team. He was doing things and uh, it became more of an issue to have him not on the core team. So it's kind of <laughs> <laughs> Basically, if you, hassle, if you hassle the other people too much. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so let's see. So you know you've been on on Rails Core for v various amounts of time, um, and you know one way that kind of Rails stays fresh is uh, is change is not sticking with one thing. Like for instance, probably not many people are doing RJS anymore. For instance, right? <laughs> uh, so this is sort of a two part question, and we can have everybody answer. Let's have everybody answer both parts, I guess, at, one, at once. So, um, probably what I'll say is, the, since you've been on Rails Core, the most interesting change that you've seen happen while you've been on Rails Core, and the most interesting change that you're excited about coming up. Um, I, I won't make anyone start because I, I got a lot of like, oh god, I have to think now. Um, does anyone want to start on this question? I'll, I'll start. The most exciting thing that I'm looking forward to is Action Cable because I have no idea what the hell it is. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what, what about since you've been on Core? What's what's one of the most what's one of the most interesting things that you've seen? Maybe you did it, or maybe you saw someone else do it since you've been on Rails Core. Um, I don't know. All the work I did with uh, adequate record was probably the favorite, my favorite stuff that I worked on. Adequate record. Adequate record. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. um, I think probably the um, most important thing for me is to kind of focus on performance and measurement we're kind of making now. Uh, so introducing all these kind of benchmarks and then monitoring the versions, different performance between versions, and then hopefully kind of you know, make Rails fire the fastest version of Rails. What about, what about interesting things in the past? Oh, think, uh, think back and you were like, finally, we're doing this. The Rails 2.3 to 3 uh, jump was probably yeah, the most interesting thing, it kind of the thing that kind of got me contributing more to Rails. Uh, so that was kind of my most interesting for the past. Okay. Interesting. interesting. I think uh, Bundler and Asset yes. Pipeline, these are things that people have loved to hate. And it's, for the most part, turned out to be incredibly positive and constructive contributions to the way that I build apps. I remember going through. Uh, Bundler issues. God, fuck bundler. <laughs> <laughs> and now I love it. I, I could not live without it. It's great for deployment, and it's one of the kinds of things that I think everybody, having been uh, kind of patient through its growing pains, um, really paid off. I think a, a shout out to somebody who's not here, uh, Raphael, who handles most of our um, our new people. He's our fir first contact for most people with Rails. New contributions is seeing Raphael comment on the pull request. Um, he is our patch monster, our pull request monster, <laughs> our comment monster, um, and our welcoming committee. So shout out to him. He's probably the best thing that's happened to Rails in the past five years. This is a just in time question generation. So I have to sometimes I have to do a little little compiler pause. Are too. you think, are you taking questions from the Twitter? Is this that what's happening? No, but if you want to if you want to tweet some questions at me uh, right now, I'll I'll put them in the queue. So we'll do we can do that too. And we have a whole slew of people who are all of a sudden wandering in. I don't know where they've been all morning, but come come on in, people of the hallway. <laughs> um, Guillermo, Santiago, Godfrey, anything about, you know, like interesting things that you've seen change or that you're excited about? Yeah, I'm really excited about the work that Santiago is doing in the Rails API project. Finally, we will include in the next version. So I want to congratulate Santiago. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I, I'm excited, excited about the, the performance work we have been doing also. Uh, the integration test being faster and all that stuff. 
and having like Ruby 2.2 uh, as a requirement to run our applications, and also about Rails API. Uh, not only because I, I did work, <laughs> <laughs> but also because we at, at Wayros we work with uh, with uh, several different kind of applications that uh, mo some of them use Ember as as client side uh, in the client side, and this will enable like I, I tend to think that this will enable these kind of applications to be like first citizens in in, in Rails. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, well, everyone else is talking about code change, so I guess I will talk about something else. Um, personally, I'm most excited and like have been pretty happy about some of the changes around the ecosystem, like some process that we have. Um, we have a much better uh, process of testing our releases these days. Like we have, like we test out latest version of Rails with Discourse and like with. Um, like other open source projects, and Raphael has been doing an amazing job, like managing the issue tracker. We now have a weekly newsletter. If you don't know about like what goes into uh, Rails every week and uh, stuff like that, I think like I'm pretty excited about some of the like these changes around the ecosystem. Make it uh, well, make it everything better. Essentially, that's that's excellent. Uh, this is a more maybe a question for me than anybody else, so I've got the mic, so suck it. Um, <laughs> I know that when Rails, when the Rails progressed from two to three, there was a performance regression and a whole bunch of things because there was a whole bunch more code, a whole bunch more sound ways of doing things. Um, does it feel like you've, and, and maybe this, this was true last year, now that I think about it, but that all of those things have been made up now and now it's sort of like all uh, always better performance than previous versions. Does that make sense? Any <laughs> thoughts there? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I think we have much better tools now to kind of monitor that. So you can now answer that question instead yeah. of. I, I think we just we just didn't know before in the kind of two point three to three change. We just it wasn't until somebody kind of filed an issue saying actually record is five times slower <laughs> that, that we knew. Okay. I think that there's also a uh, what we see is that the. The questions that are easy to ask are the ones that are easier to answer too. The active record gets a lot of attention because it's it's really glaring when there are regressions in it. And the kinds of regressions that occur are often like N plus one or, or worse. So they're in your face. And it's a situation like that is because there was uh, some design change and less often because there was a, a regression in some micro optimization that somebody may, might not have noticed. Um, but we can often miss the things that affect the performance of our applications. Like what are the choices that we're making that makes the in you know the person who's using the application, what is what's their experience and how does Rails change that? Some things like asset pipeline can be uh, kind of a hidden stars um, in making things like delivering your entire application faster for real people rather than faster in our benchmarks. Well pro the problem is like the surface area Rails is API surface area is so large that even if we have performance benchmarks, we're not going to catch everything, right? There will be some use case that somebody has in their application that we didn't have a benchmark for, and then eventually it's like that might regress. So it's difficult to keep track of that stuff. <laughs> I can say, too, that we've, we've really been helped by uh, the improvement in, in Ruby itself. Going from 1.8 to 1.9 was a massive boost, um, despite some small pains and going to Ruby 2.0 and then 2.1 and now 2.2, each one has brought significant massive improvements that um, just work across the board. Ruby 2.2, symbol GC, it's going to change the way that we write Ruby code just, just due to the fact that we can use symbols everywhere. And it seems like kind of a small thing, but those not echo everywhere. throughout the code base. <laughs> Technically not everywhere. <laughs> Asterisk. <laughs> Um, that's another good sort of transition. Um, you know, it's a very, like I said, Rails is a very large surface area. There's tons of features and tons of things in there. Um, how do you, both individually and as a group, sort of decide what to work on? So, you know, like you sit down on a Monday morning and maybe you finish something on Friday. How do you, you know, all, most of you, have other jobs. For all I know, you all have other jobs as well. So, but when you work, you're like, okay, I want to do some Rails work. How do you decide what you want to work on? You can start anywhere on this. Yeah, um, yeah personally, 
quite often I'll get pinged on issues that are to do with uh, <laughs> time or routing, so I tend to pick up those a lot. Or, or if I haven't got any of those, then I'll just go and dig into the issue you track and find something interesting. Do you set do you set time aside in your in your week to work on Rails work, or is it just that when it pops up, you're like, okay, now I'm going to put aside a day or a few hours or whatever? I try and put put aside some time. Okay. Not really. I think I work mostly on weekends or on nights. But I think latterly the work has become easier times to Raphael. <laughs> yeah, you can see the the issue tracker uh, and almost all the issue was already reviewed uh, by Raphael. Um, we, we don't follow like a, a process or anything like that. Um, I tend to work in, in, on stuff uh, based on, on issues we have at work, or, or, or from time to time I, like, I have a to-do list and put there pending things that I, I would like to fix, and maybe at some point I, I just jump there or something like that. Um, yeah, I think we, as far as as a group, I think we have a kind of loose list on Basecamp about like some of the big areas that we would like to eventually work on. Um, individually, for myself, it's just whatever like I bump into in at work and yeah, other things kind of find themselves on my list. Um, like I don't know how they get in there, but like they just automatically pop up. Like it's uh, it's uh, like you know it's April. It's time to do Google Summer of Code and then like make sure we have enough projects for our students and things like that. <clears throat> At all? Random, just random. <laughs> Snapshot. <laughs> yeah, just. No, usually it's. I mean, all it's a t it's a mixture of stuff. Like for me, it's a mixture of things. It'll either be stuff like typically performance issues that we're running into on work apps or just things that I'm interested in. Either one of those two, just. I'll say that this actually isn't true. Aaron looks for the things that give the largest look of disapproval or the greatest table flip. <laughs> <laughs> and then he dwells on them until they're fixed. <laughs> so, do you, so as a group, do you set and decide, and you know, this is maybe a quest for David, He's not here, so we'll we'll try we'll answer it as though maybe he would answer it. Um, you know, as a group, do you figure out like, okay, what's going to be in the next major release? Like the minor releases, I know. Sometimes. As a group, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what is a group? Did I say something funny? Okay. Um, or is it? Well, I mean, I know that that he drives a lot of the big features. Maybe that are going to go into the releases. Is that still mostly the operating procedure? Like. From, from we'll my just view, use Action Cable as an, exam as an example. Action Cable's, yeah, it's a different kind of example. We haven't really done something like that before. Um, from my view, we take a lot of what we've seen in working on Basecamp for the past number of years as it's turned into each version of Basecamp becomes our legacy app. And we get very intimately acquainted with the things that, uh, that we'd like to do differently. And so those are the things that come to mind when we do new development. Um, coming back to your, your last question about how we choose what to do, like I'm often reactive also when there's an issue, go fix it. Um, but do, during new development is also a great time to shape the way Rails is going to turn out. Like get on Rails Master and find the things that kind of work on their own but don't quite work in concert together um, and make them work with your app. And those are the times where you can make kind of design contributions it ought to work this way versus things seem broken here. I stub my toe. Um, so, within the issue tracker, does it seem is it is it a lot of uh, oh I tried this and it doesn't work or it blows up for some strange reason or whatever? Uh, like they're gonna you're gonna have that presumably because it's software. And then hopefully you're going to also have some feature requests. Hey, it'd be really nice if it did this. Really nice if it did that. Um, 
is there a split? Like, is it common? Is it way more issues? Is it just a few features that actually feature requests that come in? Do people? Do you get a lot of, of pull requests? Do people try and scratch your own itch on the features a lot of times? Or I'd love to just know kind of how that split breaks down, especially if you, you as you kind of said, you're all sort of work on demand as things come up. Um, then that doesn't necessarily necessitate, necessitate a lot of features, except the ones that you personally say like, oh, this is a thing. So I'm just wondering how the community helps helps you figure out how, you know, what features should go in and, and, and that kind of thing versus just pure bugs. Um, say, oh. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the issue tracker on GitHub, we mainly use for tracking uh, bugs and pull requests. So new fe just new feature suggestions, we generally direct them towards the mailing list so we can have a discussion about it before, you know, well, otherwise they just sit there on GitHub. With nothing there. So if, if you want to send in a feature request, you know you can send in a pull request. Right. Uh, but but if, but if you sent one in, it would behoove you to also start the conversation on the mailing list, saying, "Hey, I sent in a pull request about this feature, and here's my justification for it. Let's have a discussion." But that's the place to do it rather yeah. than yeah, okay. And do you, does it feel like that happens often? Do you get the, do you have a lot of feature requests, a lot of the feature discussions from the community on the mailing list? Um, fairly frequently. Yeah. 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 I wouldn't say it's high volume though. No, There's the difference between like having something you wish for versus enacting your wish is a huge gulf. And going from like the first contact with GitHub for something like um, an addition rather than a bug fix um, is a pull request, which means that you've thought through a lot about how your idea needs to interact with Rails and with other people's applications, which takes a lot more work than I wish this was here for me already, which is easy to do and easy to say, but when it's left on GitHub issues, there's not much anybody else can do about it other than just know that you have that wish. And if a lot of people have that wish, great, somebody can come in and do something about it, but there are a lot of wishes and not enough people doing things. There is, uh, Rails is also is in a pretty special place in terms of like its maturity as a project, right? Like as you probably know, a lot of people use Rails in a lot of different ways and like, we already have a very, very large API service. And so like some of that also boils down to hmm, like how many people can actually benefit from this. Like we can't have too many things in Rails. Um, so like a lot of times people would come, oh, like I need this in my app. Like it seems pretty obvious everyone would need it. Well, it turns out that perhaps not everyone need it, but it's still a very useful thing. Even though we couldn't justify putting it into Rails, perhaps you can put it, make it into a gem, and that's actually how some of the new features in Rails like was merged in, right? Like it started as a gem, and then over time, ah, this actually works, and uh, it would actually be beneficial for most people, so we we'll merged in. Do you, on that, uh, sort of on that note, as people are in the audience or watching this at some future time on the internet. Do you prefer if someone has an idea for a feature that they bring it up on the, on the mailing list before they go off and, and write a pull request so that at least you can say, well, that's a good idea, but there's all of these other things to think about before you do the pull request. Because I know that you know sometimes it can be that a pull request shows up and you oh. feel bad. Someone spent a whole bunch of time on some feature that you're like, well, but it's like really orthogonal to all these other things that we're doing. And if we add, if we, I know that you spent a bunch of time on it, but if I merge it in, it's going to cause all these other problems. So do you prefer the, the discussion on the mailing list or do you prefer to just get the pull request and then ha have that discussion afterwards? I think it, it depends on the size of the feature. Like, if it's a really, really big change, then absolutely mailing list first. But if it's like, oh, I just want to add, I've got this really cool method I want to add to active support. <laughs> 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 Probably pull requests is fine. <laughs> Are there things that people shouldn't send pull requests for? New methods to active support? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was hoping you'd say that. That's why I asked. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I have a, a strong preference any, in any direction, because I think that uh, if you have something that you need to get done, you really want to do, then making a library, a Ruby gem, or a Rails plugin, it's almost everything can be done that way these days, unless you're trying to change something in the internals of Rails, which I think is the less common case. Um, but you can just, you can implement it and you can prove its usefulness by spreading use of the gem yourself. Um, there's been a lot of talk about, especially with 
the action cable and the not, and you know how people are writing web apps and the API work for inside Rails. So you know you're all not just implementers of Rails, but uh, practitioners of it as well. So you know maybe it would be interesting to find out a little bit about how you personally within your projects are using Rails. Are you using it? Um, writing a lot of, using it for a lot of APIs and generating it, just you know, using it for a lot of JSON APIs. And I, I'd love to hear sort of the kind of what your personal philosophy is, because that that in itself helps drive what Rails looks like as well. Um, we could start. However, do you want to start, Santiago? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, given that we are we are a consultancy company, we have uh, several different projects and. Uh, we, we don't have like a strong preference of, of one way of doing stuff. It's just the the, the way that the, it's, it's a better fit for, for the projects. So uh, there, we have some projects where we use Ember or Backbone, and then we have a lot of more projects that where where we use um, the default stack. So basically, we, I mean, it depends on the project what what stuff we do. Yeah, similar to Santiago. Um, we're very much agnostic. You know, we'll use kind of microservices, you know, separate Rails apps for different parts, or you know, a monolith depending on the on the, on the application. Okay. We've been working on a, a Pico service framework. <laughs> <laughs> it's lighter weight. <laughs> All right, no, our apps at work are like basically regular stack. Nothing amazing. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm going through the internet questions now, so that's why I'm looking at my phone. Um, any other thoughts there? Yeah, monolith. Monolith. Yeah, <laughs> monolith. Yeah. Every time I hear every time I hear monolith, I just think of that Simpsons episode where he's like yes. monorail, <laughs> monolith. monorail, monolith. What if I electrified five car monorail? <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I that I felt after well years of working on Basecamp is the power of of small teams and what we can do with something that is well integrated, a monolith. Uh, but. <laughs> As a, with a small number of people, we're able to um, deliver an app to multiple platforms. Uh, we have iOS and Android apps that work from the same kind of canonical source. We don't write a separate JavaScript app. We write one app that works everywhere, and we can do it with a small number of people. So it, it, it maintains kind of a, a workplace that I love and something that, uh, that I, I've come to treasure, like being able to design a workplace that can afford you that kind of flexibility where we can work on this whole breadth of Basecamp uh, without needing tons of teams, people I don't know. Um, we all work together. Uh, that's a, a really good sort of quick quick question. If anybody can answer if they have anything, uh, any thoughts there. Jeremy just sort of answered it for him, which is, you know, we've obviously, people building mobile apps and doing lots of things for uh, on mobile. Do you feel like, uh, there are certain things within Rails that help you be able to build out, um, mo you know, interface with with mobile apps. Or I don't know, I'm just sort of throwing it out there to see if you have any thoughts as the the intersection of you know iOS, Android apps, and and Rails is a very interesting spot, and I think a huge number of people are at that exact point in time. So I'm just any thoughts there? Anybody? Merging the API stuff in the master will help. Yeah. Okay. I think well going going back in time a little bit for the technical end of things, um, doing content negotiation and being able to return multiple variants for each restful resource um, allows you to keep your representations close to your resource and the interaction in the controller. And that single thing has turned out to we've gotten a lot of mileage out of that. Um, we're going to adding explicit HTML only variants where we could serve a different page to mobile versus serving a different page to desktop. Uh, we were able to build out entire apps from the same resources just with that tiny little feature. How many miles? Like 10? 15? <laughs> Can't put a number on that, man. <laughs> okay, so I have a couple of quick <laughs> internet questions and then we'll we'll get back, we'll get to one sort of pessimistic question for me if we have time. Uh, Ernie wants to know, with 2.2 symbol GC, how soon will hash within different access die? <laughs> it won't die. 
it could never die. <laughs> well, because you, I mean, that would break the APIs, right? Because yeah. you have to be able to access what are these simple or uh, something makes sense. Yeah, he didn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> Right. The only thing that would happen there is if like symbols and strings all of a sudden became the same thing inside Ruby. Then you're like, okay, yeah, I guess it can die now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we try to do it. So I think with regards to hash with indifferent or half hash with indifferent huia, <laughs> huia. Uh, with that, we try not to use it internally. So we don't use it internally, but we use it for stuff that's user like user facing. So I don't know. I like internal, so I don't really care. Just use your hash with an internet access. We'll keep it. Most most user facing stuff is coming like we're ingesting it from the outside world where it is strings too. So it makes sense to build a hash of strings and address it within your program using symbols. Uh, okay, I'll ask my pessimistic question, and this will probably be the, the last question then we'll so we'll try to have everybody answer. Um, you all have worked on, especially a, a number of you are consultants, so you've all worked on a lot of different Rails apps that are probably in a lot of different states of usability, if you know what I mean. Uh, as you've been working on those, is there some like specific smell, some specific thing that when you run across a Rails app you're like, oh no, they did this, that you, that you every time you see it you go, oh no, they did, you know. Concerns. Maybe it's uh, <laughs> overloading something weird. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, what did you say? Concerns. <laughs> they concern me. <laughs> um, any any thoughts there, Andrew? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm like, I'm sorry, concerns. You start, yeah. Yeah. They. Um, you see people break uh, models up into like loads of little files all over the place, and you just don't know where <laughs> stuff is. <laughs> Especially when you're coming in as a consultant. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts there, Gabriel? Yeah, I've seen there are a lot of people that are still putting business logic in the controllers. Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I have yeah. seen like models with 10,000 lines of code or oh, stuff like right. that. Or, or controllers, controllers doing render text and all the HTML in the string, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so don't, don't, don't break up your models, but don't leave them as 10,000 lines. Yeah. It's just. <laughs> Very careful balance, I suppose, between the, the feast and the famine of how big the makeup. Okay, Jeffrey. Um, I think one of the biggest problem I've seen, and like I personally sometimes have this problem too, is um, not having a good grip of what you're putting in your app. Like whether it's like design patterns that you see at talks, or whether it's gems, right? Like over time, you have 20 folders in app, like with everything, every pattern possible. And like in your gem file, there are gems that no one really understands, right? Like there's a blog post on, ah, if you put this gem in your gem file, it magically makes your app faster. So you do that. And then like over time, you don't actually check whether that is still useful. And turns out that, well, on latest version of Rails, that actually makes things slower, right? Like so it's those things, like those, like have to really understand your app and be conscious of what you're Pr prune your garden, and your yeah. garden is your gem file, in other words, is what you're saying. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Aaron? Uh, putting tons of actions in the application controller, stuff I've seen. I was thinking about changing the route to just be like, changing the router to just say CGI bin in that case. <laughs> uh, but yeah, actually, a lot of, I, I was being kind of sarcastic when I said concerns, but not not that sarcastic, <laughs> like basically abuse of abuse of modules. So using tons and tons of modules, mixing in tons of modules, where you try to debug it. Like it's basically it basically becomes a debugging nightmare because you look at the module and the method in the module depends on an instance variable, and you're like, how where did that come from? <laughs> and you're like, good luck <laughs> trying to figure that out. But the worst one, honestly, the worst is just so many. So many methods or so many actions at the top level. Jeremy, you've seen the code base evolve enormously over yeah, time. Yeah, I, so. I could speak to like past me and yeah, like yeah. And there's this perfect decisions. it's base camp. <laughs> this, this is the reference application. <laughs> or I look, I look at what we did with early Rails and um, and some of those early things are are hard to change. It's not not much motivation to and. Um, things work, and uh, places where I drift from convention because I'm under time pressure or impatient, and just you know want to get shit done, and 
I, you can pay for that impatience. And uh, you, know, you pay for it on the next thing where you, you go touch that bit of code. But places where we've seen um, changes in Rails respond to that are like when we introduced uh, RESTful everything. And it's, it's now common to think of your controllers as, as resources instead of controllers that are like kind of functional bags of stuff. And so if you see any Rails applications that were born before that, that migration, it's very common to see where you're like, this kind of stuff happens here. I'm going to have a bunch of actions that do that kind of stuff. So it's organized like you know, namespaces of RPC calls rather than nouns that you do things to. I think, I mean, everybody here is probably new enough that they don't remember that transition, but I think that was one of the biggest, like, probably the biggest feature that was or added to Rails or the most impactful, in my opinion. Which was what? Adding, introducing RESTful routes. RESTful controllers, it just, it was yeah. huge. Okay, well I think that's, we'll, we're gonna call it on time. Um, thanks for being up here and fielding my ridiculous questions. And uh, let's give them all a big hand.